see a banner at the top of your Microsoft Teams that uh, just notifies you of that. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bjorn. All right. So I am going to try to go in order based on the participants list that I'm able to see on Teams. Um, if I miss you at the very end, know that it was not on purpose and please just flag it for us and um, when we get towards the end. So the first person on here uh, I see is an Anna Johnson or Anna Johnson. Hi, um, my name is Anna Johnson. Um, I guess there's a lot of things I'm interested in and excited about. Um, drawing down greenhouse gas emissions and doing so in a way that um, prioritizes racial equity and climate justice along the way, um, including um, you know, access to energy efficiency and affordable energy and um, I guess lots of different things. Also, um, cumulative impacts of uh, pollutants and environmental harms, including um, exposure to air pollution from the HERC and other um, point source facilities. And I am looking forward to playing team sports after the pandemic. Great. Thanks, Anna. Uh, Barbara? You're currently on mute, Barbara. Hi, I'm Barbara Lundy. I think that there aren't any other Barbaras, so um, I, I enjoy being on this commission. And uh, I, uh, uh, well, I put in a statement, science is real, several times in my nomination thing. And I think it is. <laughs> in fact, it is. Um, so I, I've observed that there are, uh, I, I too am, um, I'm certainly aware of climate change and uh, think that it does exist and and it would be great to everybody use less energy and less uh, other uh, resources, make it last for more generations. Um, so and it's good to have goals by say stated by Excel, which we may, we may not have much to do with, but the city and different aspects of the city. And it's even good to have aspirational goals. Aspirational goals are those that are not backed up by science, um, such as uh, Excel wants to use all, uh, um, wants to use, uh, car be carbon free by 2050. And that implies the use still of nuclear energy. Um, and uh, even so, that's very, it's, pretty aspirational because um, there's no known practical way of storing energy for, you know, even overnight, um, all the energy that we use, or certainly not for, you know, the month of December. <laughs> and uh, those may be developed, they may be developed in the next few few months, but um, in years, but right now they don't exist. So science is real, they don't exist. So I think that Aspirational goals are good, but and it's worth probably stating them as an aspirational goal and studying what it would take to to attain it, such as storage of energy for a certain period and also supply of energy by uh, non-carbon sources and so forth. But to actually spend money implementing uh, changes in our our whole uh, energy system based on aspirational goals is perhaps a waste of money because science is real and, and they are only aspirational goals. There's no way that right now that we know how to even attain it. I think this got pretty long, but um, <laughs> so after COVID, I too would like to travel. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. Uh, Indigo? Hi, um, my name's Indigo and I usually them pronouns. Um, I'm really excited to learn just more about how the city works and see how we can support the um, the East Phillips neighborhood project. And I, I think that's a really cool um, project people are working on and I would love to see yeah how this community could support that. And after COVID, I would I'm really I'm really excited honestly to probably just go back to in-person classes because I'm a student and it, online has been really hard for me. Mm -hmm. Divine. 
Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Divine. Um, I also am looking forward to learning more about the city, um, different ways that I can assist. Um, just, you know, being a everyday citizen, you don't, I don't know, you don't have that many ways to be connected. So I look forward to being connected with you all um, through various projects. Um, I also really care about East Phillips. I think that that's a really important initiative. And I think it's really important to support specifically BIPOC youth having green jobs um, and being a part of that, uh, the future, um, instead of being separate from it, um, you know, developing in them, you know, it, it only helps us all. We have a future and they're, they're the leaders. So it's really important to invest in them, especially with everything that they've been through. Um, I look forward to like going to places like, I don't know, I've actually enjoyed restaurants with nobody in them. It's been really nice. <laughs> um, but I really look forward to like just like concerts. Like I had a really important concert I wanted to go to, but it was canceled and I couldn't get my, like you, my insurance didn't cover the coronavirus. I was so upset, but it's fine. Like I hope that I can go to <clears throat> a different concert, but that's something I look forward to. And thank you all for your time. And I look forward to getting to know everybody. Live music in crowds. It's definitely an atmosphere that I know I miss too. Julia? Hello, I'm Julia. I use she, her pronouns and calling in from Ward 9. And um, I think, as was mentioned earlier, I'm the new um, Green Zone coordinator with the um, VISTA Green Zone coordinator with the um, Sustainability Division. So I'm just interested to, yeah, check out this meeting and meet all of you and see what's going on. Um, in terms of what I want to do when COVID is over, I, um, I really just want to like have a friend over to my house and like eat food together and like sit near each other on a couch. That would be really nice. Definitely agree on that front. Lauren? Hi, I'm Lauren. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm interested in uh, specifically like sustainability in buildings and um, zero energy and zero carbon buildings and, and thinking about how the city of Minneapolis, if they're giving out building permits, can um, make sure that new and rebottled buildings are efficient for, for our city. And like Anna, I'm looking forward to playing team sports and hopefully on a team with Anna because we've we've played on teams before in the past. So it's good to see her here. Great. Mark. Hey folks, um, I'm Mark Denon. I use he, him pronouns. And um, I've lived in Bryn Mawr in Ward 7 for five years now. And some of the environmental uh, interests I have have already been mentioned, but but another one I'm keen on is um, is green energy in general, but especially finding alternatives to our dependence on natural gas in Minneapolis for building and process heating. I see that as a real challenge that we need to figure out. Um, one of the big reasons my wife and I moved into Minneapolis five years ago after being suburbanites most of our life um, was uh, to get more involved with neighborhood events. You know, we live in a, in a neighborhood that has great get togethers and we've met a lot of really super neighbors, but we just haven't been able to get together in the backyards and alleys like we did before. So I'm looking forward to that. Thanks, Mark. Matthew? Hey, my name is Matthew. I use he, him pronouns. Um, and yeah, one environmental issue I'm really interested in is uh, reducing energy burdens and using energy fish efficiency um, as a tool for equity and making energy more affordable. Um, for folks in Minneapolis and beyond. 
Um, and one thing I'm really looking forward to is just like being in a house with a bunch of friends, like, like 15 would be awesome. So looking forward to that. Thanks, hey, Max. Uh, hey everyone, Max Dalton, he, him. Um, I guess what I really enjoy environmentally is, you know, we know how to do certain things, um, but what I really enjoy is thinking about how can we do them better. So we know how to recycle, how can we recycle better? Um, we know salt is bad for our water resources. How can we think about, you know, reducing salt impacts? So, you know, knowing what we do well and improving on that is what really drives me environmentally. Um, and something that I'm looking forward to is uh, last week, I got a Snapchat of my niece taking her first steps. Um, so I am really looking forward to, well, spoiling her rotten, but um, now that she's much more mobile, just getting to spend time with her. So. Nick? Hello, I'm Nick Minderman. Um, I'm, re I'm acclimating to my new life in Ward 7, just moved a couple months ago from Ward 3. Um, and uh, my office space, it's a work from home necessity now, unfortunately. Um, I'm working. One of the things I'm looking forward to is getting to see my coworkers in person. Um, my my area of I kind of have two specific areas of interest. One that I'm kind of professionally suited for, and then my my outside of day job interest. So um, professionally, my one of my primary day to day tasks is understanding customer behavior when it comes to participation in energy efficiency programs. So really digging in on what are the barriers that are related to homes and businesses that have opportunities to make their facilities operate more effectively and why they do or don't uh, pursue those. And then my outside of the day job interest is uh, really attacking the non-point source of the transportation system. So you know, there's going to be a point where we've really done a lot in buildings and the incremental investment we need to get or we need to make to get more carbon reduction out of it is going to be less cost effective than really starting to push on how we can reduce transportation emissions. And so we need to start thinking about that now so that we can ultimately do this in a way that meets the triple bottom line uh, ideal of both social, economic and environmental. Because I think my, my belief is that it is feasible to hit all three of those but you have to be methodical in, in how you approach it. What I'm looking forward to, in addition to seeing my coworkers, I have a daughter who's just about two, and I'm really looking forward to being able to take her to the playground and not having to do that awkward dance with the other parents of like, how close can the kids get with one of the two parents being uncomfortable with proximity? <laughs> that sounds like a definite challenge. Toya? Well, could it, could Could we have the three corners? Oh. Barbara, you're going on and off of mute. Can't help. Can we have the three corners of your triangle again? You, you oh. get the so the triple bottom line is social, environmental, and economic. So the okay. idea that you can Yeah, yeah, yeah. That okay, is, thank you. You're yeah. aiming for the optimization of all three. Toya, thanks for waiting. That's all right. I just wanted to say welcome to Ward 7, Nick. Um, I'm Toya Lopez, and I work for Health Professionals for Healthy Climate, and that mostly revolves around um, educating uh, both the, the community and legislators and other decision bodies, the decision making bodies on the health impacts of climate change, educating health professionals on um, environmental issues and climate change, and then also um, working on improving the footprint of the health industry itself. And I, I forget what the question was again, but I can tell you what I'm not looking forward to is in person meetings. I've been having a good like, I know people don't like Zoom meetings, but I actually really like Zoom meetings and I don't like to have, because I 
I use public transportation and walk and bike. And so not having to go <laughs> across the town to go to a meeting is like amazing. So I can definitely feel you on that one. Uh, Jacqueline. Hey everyone, um, my name is Jacqueline. I use they them pronouns. Um, I'm excited to be on this commission and learn more about how it works and um, contribute to lowering emissions and also getting community involved and engaged in city um, planning and decisions like that. Um, and I'm looking forward to being able to visit my nieces and nephews in California, as well as make meals for people and share them in person um, instead of just on my Instagram. Cooking for people is something I really enjoy too. Um, uh, Tess. Hi, Tess, she, her in Nordeast. I am generally interested in uh, climate justice and using uh, ways of addressing climate change and uh, racial and social justice in tandem. Uh, and specifically as part of SEAC, I'm really looking forward to uh, being involved with the Upper Harbor Terminal proposal um, and post-pandemic. Um, it's a little hard to imagine, but I'm also looking forward to travel and having friends over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that I left off the staff, but are there any other Besides Julia, are there any other SEAC members that I missed? Uh, Leslie. Leslie, sorry about that. Phone calls. I'm really bad at remembering the names. Go for it, Leslie. Okay, I'm interested in uh, focusing on the stormwater and the soil management that we have through the city and cutting down the emissions and um, the environmental injustice combined with the economical issues that we have disproportion that affect the north side residents. Is there and, any? Um, Go ahead. Then as far as um, when uh, the COVID's over, we can do stuff. I'm, I too want to travel. I have a passport and it's like, I need to get stamps on there. So I definitely looking forward to traveling. Also, I notice when I look in the notes, my name is spelled differently. And my name is L-E-S, capital L-E-E. -E. And it's one spelling correct, and then the next, it's not. So um, I just want that to be noted. Thank you for um, following that. And we can make sure that we double check that in the future. Thank you. And thank you for having me a part of this committee. And I'm looking forward to learning more about it and, and um, what we can do as a group to make our city safe, clean, and hazardous free. Thanks. Are there any other SEAC members that I skipped over? Hearing none, um, Kim and Bjorn, do you wanna just kind of explain your roles when it comes to SEAC? Maybe Kim first and then Bjorn second? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Uh, so my name is Kim Havy. I'm director of sustainability for the city of Minneapolis, and I'll be the staff person that supports uh, SEAC and uh, uh, administers, you know, the various details in order to make the meetings come together, and also uh, obviously be a, a conduit and um, resource uh, from the city uh, around sustainability. Um, we have, my area has uh, a number of different organizations um, that we staff, including the Energy Vision Advisory Committee, the uh, Clean Energy Partnership, the North and South Side Green Zones, um, and SEAC. Uh, so we've got uh, quite a few folks. We've got five staff members. And um, as we know, we just got a new VISTA intern uh, as well. So. Um, we've got a lot of things going on around all of those various different aspects that folks have mentioned. And I know Leslie had mentioned stormwater. Um, we will be having a presentation next month um, on the stormwater ordinance and new fee structure. It's being updated for the first time in 10 years. Um, and I think that's a really excellent topic because we are on the Mississippi River. We are part of 
uh, one of the largest watersheds um, in the world. And uh, we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is making uh, a positive impact and not uh, causing uh, harm. So, um, uh, but we that's one of the things I think we want to talk more about um, as well in our next meeting um, around the topics of interest and what we want to prioritize for 2021 and looking forward. So, um, Bjorn is uh, here. I'll turn it over to him. He is uh, helping tonight uh, to capture notes um, and make sure things are, are flowing uh, smoothly. And I too want to echo um, what I want to do after uh, this COVID, which I uh, may do even though it is going on, <laughs> is I want, uh, need to get somewhere where I can be outside and gather some sunshine and warmth for a little while. So I'm um, looking forward to traveling again. Bjorn, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Kim. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Bjorn Olson. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a sustainability program coordinator with the city of Minneapolis, so I'm working for Kim. Uh, as he mentioned uh, tonight, I'm kind of here as a uh, backup, uh, taking notes, uh, you know, being the second in, in command or, or uh, you know, recording and things if somebody's internet goes out. So we have a we have a plan B for that. Um, my work is, is primarily around greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, in our sustainability or our sustainable building uh, policy that we're developing and also our energy benchmarking program. Um, for a lot of our uh, over 50,000 square foot buildings. So, um, you know, approaching things with an equity lens and an environmental justice lens is, is really something that we're moving forward with uh, and, and working internally as well as externally on. And it sounds like there's a lot of great opportunities uh, to work with folks here uh, in the future coming up. So I'm super excited about that. Um, Post COVID, we need to get some some babysitters uh, up in our house. My my wife and I had twins in May, uh, and we're the the wheels are starting to come off. So we just we it's anybody warm bodies anybody on the call if you're interested, let me know. Uh, so that'll that'll be what we're looking forward looking forward to. So thanks everybody. Glad to be here tonight. Bjorn and I are past co-workers in another life. So Bjorn, I will hit you up on the babysitting aspect. Uh, so moving on into the next part of the agenda, um, I had sent out um, a survey just to get a better sense of some of the questions um, new members had about what SEAC is and how we interact with each other. Um, and then about some of the different priorities. So I did just want to run through that. And afterwards, we'll run through a question and answer session. Um, if there are questions while I'm doing the presentation, um, I'm not going to be able to see any of like the hands raising, either like physically or through the Teams app. So unmute yourself and just start saying Aaron, and I will stop and let you ask your question. All right. And this is my first time trying to do a PowerPoint presentation through Teams. So see how this goes. Unless it's going to die. OK, can everybody see this and can you still hear me? Yep. Fantastic, thank you. So I know that we just went through and introduced ourselves to each other. Um, I wanted to just show this list, um, the list of SEAC members and how it's broken down by ward. So you can see that we don't quite have um, uh, the entire city's geography covered ward wise, uh, but this is definitely something that's been improving over the last several years of um, the Community Environmental Advisory Commission. We used to be very heavily lean towards about three um, wards. So I really appreciate that that there's been interest from um, different parts of the city. And this list of uh, members is also on the uh, LIMS website. So the Legislative Information Management System, if that's what LIMS stands for. Um, and it's where you can find the SEAC agendas, meeting minutes, and then find out um, a list of all the all the folks who are on SEAC. And I just wanted to go through a few highlights about 
some of the structural things that are put into place when it comes to SEAC. So our uh, the enabling resolution for this body was updated in November 2019, 18. Years are hard. Time has just been flowing in weird ways. I think it's 2019. Um, it was 2018. 2018. Okay, November 2018. The last, the last term was 2019 to 2020, and it was right before that term. Thank you, Nick. So um, we ended up changing the enabling resolution to try to make sure that membership would, uh, should could be more reflective of those who live and work within the city of Minneapolis. Previously, SEAC membership was allocated to um, four people representing environmental advocacy groups, four people representing businesses, four technical advisors, um, four residents, and then three people who were appointed through various government bodies. So the Park Board, um, Hennepin County, and then the uh, Minneapolis Public Schools. So we kind of like through the changing of the enabling resolution, we took away those categories to just try to make it be more reflective of um, the community aspect of the Community Environmental Advisory Commission. Um, and it's something that we're continuing to work on and uh, change over time. Uh, per our enabling resolution, we can suggest environmental priorities for city policies, programs, and projects using criteria including, but not limited to, natural and built environmental impact, community impact, timeliness, environmental justice, and equity. And um, SEAC is supported by the Sustainability Division. Beyond the enabling resolution, we have some bylaws to be able to meet. We need a quorum of members to be present. Um, and that's especially important, especially in this um, online setting. We can't hold a meeting unless we have quorum. And if we lose quorum, we have to stop. Um, all voting is done with those who are present. Voting by proxy isn't allowed. So if for some reason I couldn't make a SEAC meeting, I couldn't have my friend um, step in for me and vote for me uh, in a meeting. In time sensitive, and I also couldn't vote like ahead of time either. In time sensitive cases, draft comments can be submitted by the chair or vice chair as long as the document states that the comments are subject to review and acceptance by SEAC. We haven't really had to use this much, but it is a way that we can have some wiggle room if there is something that comes up really quickly that um, we just don't have a time to put together a meeting or have chance to discuss things together um, in this sort of a format. Um, chair and vice chair shall be elected within SEAC by a majority vote of members present at a meeting, and the election shall be held no later than the second meeting of the calendar year. So that's part of the reason why I was saying I'm current chair. Um, at the next meeting, one of the first things that we'll be doing is holding a vote uh, to determine the new chair and vice chair of SEAC. And so towards the end of the meeting, um, I'll be describing a little bit more about like what the chair and vice chair roles are. I know I sent that to everyone via email um, and it would be helpful to know if anybody um, who is on uh, the call today and, and then we can also ask those who might be be not able to be present today um, who might be running so that we can let everybody know. And at the February meeting, we'll probably have all those candidates have like short maybe two minute speeches just to try to get a sense of um, who we would want to vote for since we're all still getting to know each other. I have a question, a uh, yep. couple short questions. Your staff, is that correct that your staff uh, from the city? I, um, am, I am not, I am, um, well, I'm Erin Niehoff. I do not work at the city of Minneapolis, but I have been in the chair for SEAC um, for three years. Okay, and yeah. so you're eligible. There's no reason you wouldn't be eligible to continue. Is that correct, Erin? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. But it would be something where, like everybody else, I would have to um, state that I was running mm -hmm. and I would need to be elected. And then I guess one more question. It seemed like you're treating us as if we're sort of all new members, or I certainly am, but um, are we all new members or how, how many of us are, are holdovers, you might say? Or? Great question. 
So um, the folks who are um, hold holdovers, who, are, who were members last term include Sandy, uh, Mark, and Nick. Wow. So w is this typical of having such a uh, large turnover? Um, it has been over the last few years, but that's mostly just because of how the um, the body itself has been changing culturally. Uh, I would say that a lot of people chose not to run again from last year into this year because of all of the racial equity concerns that have been coming up in the city of Minneapolis. And they really wanted to make sure that they, you know, weren't prioritized over um, someone else who might really want to have a, a shot to join um, SEAC. It's also something to where um, city staff, so Kim could probably speak to this better than I could, um, look through those nominations and uh, provide recommendations to city council and um, to the mayor's office in terms of uh, who to move forward for, for um, the positions. Yeah, I was just going to say that all that is true and that, you know, we did change over the bylaws and and who was part of it. I mean, it, prior to 2018, we had, um, you know, uh, four or five representatives from like the school board, park board, Hennepin County, that kind of thing. So and we also had a more, you know, sort of uh, wasn't Minneapolis based residents. It was more technical and different things. So those changed over a lot of how things went and then also the whole idea of um, trying to get a, a wide diversity of, of folks so but mainly you know we had folks that uh, did step back and um, uh, so that did open a lot of opportunity for new members mm -hmm. yeah so great question um, and i would say too like i know that it can sometimes be disconcerting to be joining a group when you feel like everybody else has left so why in the world would you want to join a place where everyone else has been leaving um and so i do hope that we're able to continue having a uh a sort of norm here on siac about being able to, to talk about things that feel um uncomfortable or being willing to talk about things that we want to be doing you know process wise differently together um so in our bylaws currently uh appointed members can be replaced if they miss three consecutive monthly meetings without contacting the SEAC member chair vice chair or city staff person one of the big difficulties we ran into um like three ish years ago was um there were a lot of people who had positions on SEAC but weren't attending meetings and weren't contacting the um, city staff or the chair or vice chair and so quorums were missing and so it made it really difficult to um, pass anything. Um, per our bylaws we're required to meet at least quarterly and it is something where we are um, we have been meeting for once a month and I don't know exactly like how many years that's been going on for but it's been happening since I joined SEAC um, and on occasion, we can call for a special meeting. Um, per the fact that we're all meeting virtually now, our meetings are open to the public and are now being recorded for the city's YouTube channel. Um, the city clerk has been thinking about having standard bylaws for all advisory boards and commissions, typically called ABCs. So if you ever hear me use that, that means advisory boards and commissions. Um, and so these bylaws might change at some point um, during our term, uh, this two year term. But for now, these are the bylaws that we uh, are that we need to follow. So speaking of other advisory boards and commissions, the city has about 50 of them. Um, so Kim talked about some of the other uh, um, ABCs that's that the Community Environmental Advisory Commission, you know, interacts with most frequently through the Sustainability Division. So the Northern and Southside Green Zones, the Energy Vision Advisory Committee, Clean Energy Partnership, and then the Food Council used to be housed within the Sustainability Division, but it's now in the Health Department. But they are another advisory board and commission that we have interacted with. 
So what does SEAC do? We provide advice to city staff and officials on the environmental effects of city policies, programs, and projects. But when it comes to state legislation, state agencies, and utility companies, we can provide recommendations on things outside of the control of the city of Minneapolis, but the advice needs to be directed to the city of Minneapolis staff and many city of Minneapolis elected officials. We can't write directly as a body to state officials or those outside the city of Minneapolis structure. Sometimes you'll hear it being called the enterprise. Um, so, but that does not mean that you can't send something as an individual. You just can't state that like on behalf of SEAC, I am writing to you about X, Y, and Z. Um, and if you have any particular questions about that, if you're thinking about writing an op-ed or um, anything like that, I'm always happy to, to help with navigating those sorts of um, guidelines. I have a quick question. This is Leslie. Yeah. Uh, and you said that, so we advise the city and and on certain things. Now, not just myself, but I heard other members say what issues they wanted to work on, and they spoke of hurt, and yep. that's a county issue. So, I'm I know I get the 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 breakdown of offices and who controls what, and the county got the garbage, and Metro got you know Metro Council has this and all that kind of stuff. Now, because certain things in the county affects the city, can, how do we address that, like HERC? Mm -hmm. how, does, how, does, how does that get addressed? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically what we would do is we would send advice to the city of Minneapolis staff or elected officials about what we would want them to be doing or managing with the county. But I wouldn't be surprised if there has potentially been some communication between SEAC and the county before, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Kim, do you have any anything to? Yeah. Well, previously we did have Tony, you know, from the Hennepin County. That was like the seat that he had held. held. Um, but you know, one of the things that we can look at with with Herc is what's the city involvement too. Um, so, for example, you know, we do have. Re you know, again, it's kind of controlled by the county, but, you know, we're required to, to have our garbage go there. Um, and uh, that, you know, everyone's paying into that. Um, so looking at ways that we can do it, we also can make requests to the city uh, to uh, to look at um, HERC and to make determinations about it. Um, and certainly the whole idea of, uh, uh, getting educated, understanding what the impacts are, and being able to speak uh, to it um, from that kind of standpoint as well, too. So it's sort of gently in the old days, you know, well, you would be able to say, well, let's hold a, you know, town hall forum or something on this situation or, or things like that. Um, but we can certainly look at how you bring attention to the impacts of a pro project like that. Um, so those are all opportunities or actions or roads that could be taken. Hey, Aaron. Yeah, Nick. Can can I jump in and actually continue on the Herc example uh, sure, uh, and talk it. about what happened in the last term? Yeah, because I think that's a great example. So another thing that we as SEAC can done and, and did do on Herc last time was meet with those other parties in an information gathering capacity rather than in an advising or policy making capacity. So we arranged for a tour of the Herc facility and were, were given a tour by Hennepin County to hear what they say about it. And then we also met with uh, one of the SEAC members arranged for a meeting with uh, Representative Ilhan Omar's office to talk about their um, ideas on zero waste policy. So it gives SEAC an opportunity to gather information and help um, boil it down, distill it down into those recommendations that go to the city, but it doesn't have to just be informed by information that was provided to us by the city. So I got a, a question um, based on that. So when you 
did this presentation and you went in, I mean, they did their presentation. You physically went in there. You listened to everything. Did you see data from the pollution control with their monitors or any other complaints and violations when you went in there from the information they gave you? Did you see the breakdowns of one of the um, machines that they had um, wasn't working and um, how they, they cut down on that and sent that garbage out to Plymouth somewhere? Did you guys look at numbers and 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 did a comparison bef after you came up with what your what you did. I was just curious out of how yeah. that process went. Aaron, do you want me to? Yeah, if you answer, don't mind. since I was uh, since I was part of both meetings, I'll say, um, of course, the county presented the county's perspective, and that's why we also did the meeting with Representative Ilhan or Omar's office because. Uh, their perspective was different and hearing the information provided by both groups uh, helped us think about what some of those interpretation issues are or some of the incomplete data issues are. And it sounds like you also have some experience with some direct issues too that would ultimately help us make recommendations to the city about what the concerns are and um, prepare for a potential rebuttal that might come from another organization so that the city staff is well equipped to carry through on whatever we recommend might be in the interest of city residents. Does that, I know that some of this will seem clearer, especially as we start working on these things together, but does that expl explanation help at least for now? Yes, it does. Um, I I um, did a uh, while I was attending the University of Minnesota. I did a project on her, and um, I'm I have a video, but I'm working because I'm a member of um, EJCC too. I'm working with somebody there to re-edit it and give and put more current data data into that video that I did. Gotcha. And I. Um, hoping maybe it can be used as an edu educational format on this. And I just still getting my bearings out of being out of school and it feels good. <laughs> so I got to use my passport. So anyway, yeah. um, that was just a question because it was a separation of county and city. And a lot of the things the county does does affect us. Not yeah. just on the north side, but the south side as well. And so I was just wondering how that interacts with, with what we do. And that was very clear, and, and I can understand it. Thank you very much for your time for explaining it to me. Oh, of course. I mean, that's what we are here as a group to do. And so I would say, too, especially if there are particular topics and issues that we wrestle with as a body, um, we should think creatively about the ways that we can fit within um, our enabling resolution, uh, but put apply pressure in the ways that we want to. Okay. So as a, just a quick look back, some of the th topics that SIAC has targeted in the past include, um, this, uh, this image over here is of crumb rubber, uh, the city of Minneapolis, or SIAC worked with um, the park board and public schools to talk about crumb rubber and figure out uh, you know, the health impacts that it has on kids and about if we should change um, the policies around what sort of uh, sort of cushioning uh, element is put on the base of playgrounds. Um, recommendation was to not use crumb rubber. So that's one of the reasons why some of that did change um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I have this bag stuck in the fence. One of the things that we have uh, done, especially in this last year, was the part of the bring your bag, bring your own bag ordinance and working with um, council member Gordon on uh, some of the proposals that he had on that. Yeah. Up here I have just a picture that I took off the internet um, about uh, just to kind of showcase sustainable building design. Um, so some of the uh, 
work that we've been doing is around policies regarding um, sustainable buildings, both for the city and thinking about what we can, what sort of pressure we can apply uh, to others who are building buildings that are not the city of Minneapolis. Um, down here is Roof Depot. Uh, I, for those who were on the uh, December meeting, I know that you heard a little bit more about this and I don't wanna dive into too much detail here in this particular moment, but this is an ongoing thing that um, it sounds like we'll probably be continuing to do some work on. And then electric vehicles, we've, um, SIEC has recommended some different uh, resolutions and policies regarding uh, electric vehicles and the infrastructure that goes in to support them. Um, so with all of that said, now what? I am curious about what you want these meetings to look like uh, based on my understanding of um, SIEC pre you know, 2015, they used to do more like informational type presentations and uh, less so on the advice front in some respects. Um, the level of formality we want to use, like I'm supposed to use Robert's rules um, of order or whatever, but I'm not that formal and I'm fine with also just being called Aaron. The next, the new chair and vice chair might have different, uh, different opinions on that sort of like level of formality, but that's kind of how I've been rolling. Um, and yeah, in the past uh, year-ish, we've actually set up a new um, Google form for presenters to fill out prior to presenting to SIAC to better understand what it is that they're hoping to get from presenting to SIAC. Uh, to better weed out some of those people who wanted to present just to give us information that we then felt like we had no use to actually do something with it. Um, so, but that's another thing that we, you know, is not required and it's just a, a sort of norm that we ended up creating. So all of these sorts of different things can um, change. And so I don't know if, um, We'll get into more of a discussion on these things in a minute um, in terms of what happens outside of meetings. We have a Google Drive that I share all the documents in um, so that we can work on writing letters and stuff in there and just making general plans through that. And so after this meeting today, I am going to be sending um, an, uh, a link or an invitation to everybody using the email addresses that Kim has been using to invite you all to the um, meetings um, today. So if you have a different email address that you'd prefer to use um, and you somehow can't get into the Google Drive, please flag it for me and I would be happy to get it shared with you in some other way. Um, we used to have some subcommittee meetings outside of meetings, but that's really something that hasn't been happening since moving onto this virtual platform and based on some of the interpretations of open meeting laws from uh, by the city clerk. Uh, so some of this stuff is still really up in the air. Um, so the main thing about, you know, what happens outside of meetings is oftentimes like email communications, occasionally phone calls, depending on who's working on what and um, working in the Google Drive. Yeah. I'm actually going to stop there for a second. And I am curious just to get a general sense of, you know, what sort of level of formality or like ways people want to go about setting our agendas, that sort of thing. I know this is also very open ended. Well, I looked at the agenda and the comparison to the other agendas that I've been reading and meetings I've been attending. I think the way that everything is running so far, and this is my second meeting, 
I, I'm, I'm fine with the way everything is right now. I don't know. I can only speak for me. It's mm-hmm. simple, easy. It's direct, right to the point, and links are connected. And I, I feel that everything just falls in place, order for, you know, order in. I just, I, I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. I don't see any changes. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, I see that someone has their hand raised, but I can't tell who it is right now. So uh, I do, Aaron. Okay, thanks, Mark. Sorry. Uh, so uh, first of all, you know, I, I agree. I, I like the level of formality that we've been using the last year or so. I'm, I'm certainly not uh, real formal myself. Um, from an agenda setting standpoint, I think what I would prefer would be a mix of of topics that SEAC might recommend, but also, you know, I really like when Kim and his team come to SEAC with uh, a particular topic that or policy or plan that they would like uh, input on. Yeah, you know, so I, I think a blend of that makes a lot of sense, and uh, you know, I I both would like to have some um, independence on what we talk to, but also, you know, I'd really like to help Kim and his team out on mm-hmm. on his hot issues. Yeah, and then last, um, you know, when you mentioned, you know, what our preferences were about pre-read and so on, and and personally, I I really like having some pre-read in advance of a of a meeting so I can do a little bit of homework, get familiar with the topic. Um, you know, I'd really like to have at least a week advance uh, notice on that if possible. But um, but that that helps me a lot. Of the few faces that I can see, I can see head nods, but you know, I can only see four people. So. The other person who uh, is is Tess had her hand up as well okay. too. So yeah, uh, Tess. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, I was I'll second. I think pretty much the things that Mark said. Um, as far as my very limited experience so far, um, I was wondering, Aaron, or if anyone else would want to elaborate a little bit on having presenters, how does that typically work? Do like different organizations sort of contact you or contact Kim and say, we'd like to present and how does that happen? Um, I do appreciate the idea of not having presentations just for the sake of presenting information to us. I would really like us to be focused on things where we can actually uh, have some sort of effect So to answer your question, in the past, typically the agenda itself was uh, primarily set by the uh, city staff, and it was typically based on different presentations that are people who had come to um, the former head of sustainability with, you know, saying that they wanted to present to SEAC. they also had that in addition to um, particular requests for presenters as well, but it was oftentimes um, more dictated by city staff. Now though, over the last um, year or two, we've been uh, working on trying to like weed out some of those different presentations that might just be you know, wanting to inform us about um, TCE pollution, even though it's not something that's uh, through the air, even though if that's not something that's like a current concern here in Minneapolis for any of our neighborhoods, they just wanted to let us know about it. And that was the sort of impetus for creating the Google form to have presenters fill out to ask like what it is that they're looking to have SEAC do about their presentation. And I feel like, and I am biased, since this was my idea. Um, But I think that it's really helped with making sure that the presentations that we do get are things that we can actually take action on as a body, as opposed to just learning about some, you know, 
pollute pollutant that doesn't actually make any you know difference here to Minneapolis residents. Barbara, you're on mute. Oh, you're back on mute. Okay, there you go. Oh, now you now you muted yourself again. I didn't. Okay. Her. Okay. <laughs> I like the idea of taking action. And what is the action? Would it be like a letter to the city council or a suggested ordinance or a modification of an existing ordinance or what kinds of action are you talking about? So typically it is something in writing, whether that's a letter or an ordinance suggestion or an ordinance change, a resolution, all those sorts of things are things that we can work on together. But typically it is something that's done in writing so that we are able to come to agreement together on what the language is. Would we ever have minority reports where uh, some people would want something and other people wouldn't? And, uh, you know, so there'd be maybe a majority of those voting that would, but the minority feels strongly about it that they have some voice or have, you know, some reason to feel differently. Yeah, so um, that's actually a really good question. So back in 2019, when we had been providing advice on the bring your own bag ordinance, um, we said that in general, as a body, we were supportive of it, but we had particular qualms around um, a few particular issues. And there were a few people who felt strongly enough about those qualms that they did not want to say to move forward with the bring your own bag ordinance. And so I ended up saying that the vote was not unanimous and that, I, and then in a footnote, I did put in like what the concerns were of the, um, mm -hmm. the people who did not vote yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, but I will say that it's kind of, um, there's no set rule on it. Okay. So something that we would need to decide as a body or have whoever's leading us make that sort of decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Tess, I know that I had moved on for a second there, but did I help with answering your original question about how the agendas are set? And how we get here about presenters. Yeah, that's helpful, thanks. Okay. Um, what is the, well, I guess you said it would sort of be up to us, but how have you done it before? Who has made the decision? And what was the process for picking which presenters to have or not to have? Yeah, so the uh, final decision really does rest with the chair um, in partnership with the um, sustainability division staff member um, for this committee. Uh, what I've been starting to do, and it's not something that I've really made a habit yet, and I'm hoping that it's something that we can make a habit, is towards the end of one month's meeting, um, asking folks you know, who they might wanna hear from if we have received some different presentation requests. Uh, um, cause I do appreciate, you know, letting other people say what they want to hear about because I'm my own person and so are all of you. And I don't want to be the only one dictating who it is we hear from or what it is about. So, uh, typically I have been taking like the last little bit of time in meetings to just to ask about some of the different, um, agenda topics we have coming up and making sure that, you know, what we might do the next month sounds reasonable to folks. Are there any other particular questions? I have one. It, it kind of, I don't know how to word it, but what is the success rate of the issues that um, this committee had had gone after or tried to uh, sway or change some policies within the city itself? If that's what happens, I don't know. I was just saying, what is the success? 
honestly, that's not something that I've tracked, and I don't know that it was tracked even before I joined the um, committee. So I don't know, Kim, if you have any particular insight. I don't have uh, any specifics. It has not been tracked uh, and since I've been leading the division, but uh, it's interesting to look at. I mean, I can I can anecdotally, we can refer to some things as, as, as Aaron could as well, but um, I think it was a good move forward with, you know, our attempt to reduce the amount of plastic bags that were um, being given away, you know, for free. And we imposed, uh, the, the city wanted to, you know, get rid of plastic uh, bags as they've done in, in many developed countries and, and, and many all over the world. But anyway, we, we basically came up with a concept of charging a nickel. I thought that was a, a really good um, proposal moving forward. Um, and then there's also been, you know, like just recently, the Green Fleet policy. I've had really good communications with our public works folks on that and, and the language and how it's being adopted um, based on recommendations from SEAC has been very well received. So that's, uh, you know, a, something that hadn't been updated for 10 years and affects 2,000 cars that the city owns and drives around. So, I mean, there's some good impacts, especially when we're able to work, I think, within um, – you know, either within the city or intergovernmental um, things, we do have the ability to do some really good influence there. Starting or creating a whole policy on something, it takes time. Um, but uh, CX been around for a long time; it's the longest and uh, uh, serving advisory commission to the city of Minneapolis of of any you know committee. So it's been really active in a lot of ways, and it ebbs and flows over time. I think just as a counterpoint, and then I will go over to Toya. Um, so one of the things that we were experiencing as a body last year was uh, we'd been writing to the city council on uh, Roof Depot and wanting to get answers back from them about specific things that were happening in the process. And we were hearing nothing. Um, and so that took a lot of pressure to be able to get um, any sort of feedback from those council members. But we did, towards the end of the year, end up having a presentation, well, a conversation with council member Jenkins and council member Bender. Um, so there are certainly times where we end up hearing nothing, and that can be really frustrating. Um, and so it's kind of a mixed bag, depending on what the topic is and how contentious it is. Toya? Yeah, I think um, that question had me thinking just about um, recording our, um, I guess, like successes and learning opportunities um, would be really great, especially for us here uh, currently and also for future members, since we really, many of us have a very limited uh, time, right, to, to be on SEAC and um, be able to contribute our, our thoughts. Um, and I'm also thinking it would be good to, well, not only kind of archive the work we've done and find some way to, you know, keep this in going into the future, like a, by having a librarian role or something, but also uh, maybe goal setting, like what do we, what is like a, a success look like? Um, like, and also some things are obviously going to take more than a, a couple years to uh, be accomplished and to have us having to restart, mm -hmm. you know, every year basically um, can really slow down uh, movement. So, yeah. Those are definitely all things that I, um, especially as we start picking particular issue areas, I think it would also be well helpful to talk about what we want, really want to see as a body, like the sort of change that we want to be making, um, and then thinking more specifically about uh, the goals as they relate to particular topic areas. Um, I'd be really interested, Kim, in finding out more about how we can do breakouts in teams, because I feel like that would help. Is something that was a lot easier when we were able to split up in person to um, talk about some of these different topics as opposed to having 25 people trying to brainstorm at one time. 
Yeah, and I, you know, I, I also wanted to just bring up that um, uh, we are very interested in um, starting a process of updating our climate action plan in the third quarter of this year. Um, and of course, we would, we are going to be looking um, at all the different topics that are part of that, and of course, want SEAC to be intricately involved in looking at that. So again, the work teams and and understanding how we can balance all that. Um, but um, we are, we're, I think this is why it's like, there's a lot of different topics to go over, but next month, I think too, we'll start talking about some of the things that uh, we see as part of sustainability um, division to be working on uh, as we go forward um, and what we're engaged in right now, and then how we can integrate and support not only the work that we're doing in sustainability, but across the city and in other areas. But of course, we have to be realistic and understand capacity and time and, you know, mm -hmm. how things move. Um, but uh, we want to have as much engagement and much of your expertise as absolutely possible to uh, um, help guide our, our actions on climate. And um, now that we're coming out of COVID and we're seeing what the health impacts have been of pollution and uh, for air quality and all kinds of uh, stressors related to heat and cold and um, as a result of inefficiencies, all of this starts to make a very uh, connected way to look at the health of our community and the health of our environment being in intricately uh, connected. So yeah, I, I think we'll be uh, having an opportunity to talk more about those kind of things starting our next meeting and going forward. Yeah. Um, and just with the changeover that we've had in terms of membership and stuff, and because uh, Liz Stout, who works with Public Works, doesn't often come to SEAC asking to be able to present anything related to water, um, it is something where we just decided to move forward with having that presentation in February. So thank you for um, allowing us to make that sort of executive decision. Um, I am hoping that you're able to see the screen that I'm sharing right now. Uh, based on the survey that I sent out, this is just a sampling of some of the different uh, topics that were suggested. And I will say that this is more than we would obviously be able to kind of handle in, uh, in a year. It's especially been more difficult in this sort of virtual format to be working on many different things at one time. Um, and so I think that that's still a process that we're working on figuring out how we can make ourselves more, make the body more efficient and in, in how we work through these sorts of things together. So I want to- Which types of water are you talking about for next month? So it's on stormwater. It's an ordinance around stormwater um, and around stormwater fees structure or something. Kim, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, there's it's a, it's around stormwater and the fees, and then also there's a stormwater uh, fee credit based on how much green space and uh, water infiltration on a particular site you get. Uh, you know, up to 100 percent credit. Well, it's not going to be 100 percent. It's going to be it was 100 percent. It's going to be now 75 percent based on water infiltration. Um, so it's going to be an explanation of of how the city is going to bring more stormwater into uh, you know being cleaned and all that kind of stuff too. So the type of green space. Thank you. Yeah. So between now and the February meeting or even at the February meeting, um, I'll certainly um, be thinking about uh, what sort of process we might use to help with narrowing in on particular topics and figuring out where we might wanna start um, focusing our efforts on first. And I would say, particularly in this time of uh, large transition, if you have particular questions about things SEAC has done in the past or what sort of letters we've written about particular topics, um, please feel free to email me. I might not always have the answers, but I'm happy to try to help to make sure that you have the sort of context and background information that um, you feel you want to have to be able to make informed decisions. So. Um, that's always open, and that includes even even if I am not um, chair in the future. Uh, 
Um, are there other particular questions regarding CX role, responsibilities, how we function, any sort of thing like that? I know this is very process oriented. Um, like how often are you like reaching out to the city council and stuff? Excellent question. It really depends on the topic area. I would say that the number of emails that I sent to city council this last year, um, maybe five ish contacts to the full council. Um, and uh, sometimes those contacts included multiple issues at one one time. But it really depends again on the topics that we end up deciding to focus on. Tess. Yeah, on that topic, I would just like to bring up that uh, the Upper Harbor Terminal is something that folks talked about at the last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a lot of detail about what SIAC has done on that so far, but the City Council is slated to be voting in late February. So if that is something that we want to have any involvement in, it's uh, pretty time sensitive. Yeah. I would say that just in terms of the fact that we haven't gotten all the oaths of office in and stuff, we unfortunately aren't able to vote on things as a body yet. So I don't think that as a body we'll be able to send anything to council in time for that meeting unless it gets postponed, which I know it's already been postponed, but it might get postponed even more, who knows. Um, uh, so in the meantime, if we aren't able to do something as a body, feel free to, um, obviously as an individual, send out some comments, but if you're interested in talking about this particular issue as a, um, a small group or something and thinking about how you'd want to phrase your comments to council as an individual, that's definitely something that we can work on together too. Any other particular questions? Say, so Aaron, mm -hmm. this is Mark Dennett. Um, so last year we had a, a couple of presentations um, at SEAC from community action groups. Yep. And and I found those both very important and motivating, you know, to really see the the issues, the passion, the people that are involved. Um, but I also found them somewhat frustrating because, you know, being community groups, you know, non-professional organizations, they weren't necessarily organized in their arguments and efficient at delivering it, you know, in the limited amount of time that we have to really consider those kinds of things. So I'm I'm kind of struggling to figure out how we might be able to continue to get those voices, but to get them in a form that is really, you know, effective time-wise and content-wise for SEAC to be able to weigh and to consider. And and I don't know if it would be, you know, if, if we get notified of a, a community voice that wants to get in front of SEAC if if maybe we have a process to have a member or two work with them to maybe summarize their points and to you know get them into a format that that we as a a, a group can effectively consider. I don't have a good answer, but I just thought it might be good to think of a process ahead of time so we're ready if and when those arise. Yeah, well, I don't have a particular answer to any of that. I think what it did spark for me is just a reminder because it's in my brain doesn't mean that it's in everybody else's brain. Um, reminder that if there are particular topics that you're really interested in SIAC getting a presentation on, if you hear from community groups that you're connected with or something you hear about in your particular ward, please feel free to bring it forward and suggest it as an agenda item. Um, uh, typically in advance of the meeting is preferred, uh, uh, but it is something that is the main way that we've been hearing from some of these different community voices is from SEAC member recommendations and from just connections um, that as members we've been 
making into some of the different wards and neighborhood groups. Okay. Anything else? Hearing nothing, I'm gonna say that we can move on to the next little piece of the agenda. Uh, doesn't mean that you can't come up with questions later or in other meetings. Um, and uh, I would say too, especially if there's something that's, that doesn't feel like it's working well for you in a meeting, um, that's definitely something that is helpful feedback for um, Kim and for the uh, leadership of the commission, just to make sure that it, we're able to make this time productive for people who are volunteering their time. So let's see. So the next part on our agenda right now is about nominations for chair and vice chair for 2021. And I just want to read through like what the chair and vice chair roles are. And also note too that, again, these are norms and they are not written down in um, in any sort of formal way. So if there are particular things that like, if you run for chair and then become chair and there are changes that you wanna make to the way different things work, that is um, your prerogative. So I'm working on trying to bring up the notes that I had. And I'm struggling. Oh, there it is. Okay. So briefly again, the chair helps with setting the monthly agenda, liaisons with city staff in preparation for meetings, sends letters on behalf of the commission to city staff, council, and or the mayor, depending on the topic. Um, and then the chair also facilitates the meetings uh, and tries to keep the pace moving and can call special meetings as needed uh, as a body. Um, if we have more than a quorum that calls for a special meeting, I think that that's something that's possible, but I'd have to look back at the bylaws. In terms of for the vice chair, the vice chair assists as needed, filling in on tasks above in, ca in cases where the chair is un unable to fill their duties. Um, if the vice chair wants to. Um, in the past, some of the vice chairs haven't necessarily wanted to participate in the agenda setting meetings, but I would say that um, uh, that is definitely something that has happened in the past. So a vice chair could participate in some of those agenda setting kind of conversations. And again, both positions are malleable. Uh, past chairs and vice chairs have been more hands off or hands on depending on their preferred leadership style. So with that, um, I'm curious if there are any questions about those particular positions. And then after answering any questions, uh, we will open the floor for nominations for chair and vice chair. So any questions? Hearing none, is there anybody who would like to run for the position of chair or vice chair? Barbara? Oh, I can't hear you. You're on mute. I run for vice chair. Okay. I personally would like to run for chair again, but I also recognize that I have been in this position for three years. So um, opening it up for other nominations for the chair and vice chair positions. Okay, hearing none. Um, what I will do is just make sure to follow up with um, everyone via via email um, and also making sure to flag those folks who are not in the meeting today just to see um, if there's anybody else who wants to run for those two positions. Otherwise, we'll have a very short vote and we'll we haven't figured out how to do the vote via um, 
teams yet because we've never done elections virtually. Um, so that's another thing that we'll be working on figuring out before February. Yeah, we'll we'll work on figuring that out, but we can always make a similar vote, you know, by especially if it's an easy slate forward. But um, also just want to know that, you know, if you're interested in uh, running um, for the chair, you can certainly talk to me about it. I'd be very happy to uh, spend some time uh, talking it over, getting providing an information background you need as well, too. And um, we'll be, what we'd like to be able to do is, um, you know, obviously a week before our next meeting, which we haven't officially set, but let's say it's the same third Wednesday, the February 17th, we'd like to have, um, if you are interested in uh, a nomination or your, your hat in the uh, uh, ring, so to speak, um, by the week before that meeting. So we can make sure we have that or even, so anyway, let us let me know if you're interested, be happy to talk with you about it. And I will say too, if there, if anybody does want to run for chair, it's also the sort of thing where I'm happy to help with mentoring. Again, I know that I've been on the body for a while, so I have a lot of institutional type knowledge um, that I know can sometimes feel really helpful as chair. Um, so don't necessarily let that prevent you from thinking about it if you are interested in that sort of position of leadership. Toya. Hi, um, maybe this is already written somewhere and this might be like a like a redundant question, but is there like a like a duties description for the chair role somewhere or like a estimated time commitment? Yeah, so the only thing that we have in writing is that the chair facilitates the meetings and sets the agenda with the um, staff contact for SEAC. There, um, like I said, it's kind of been more hands-on or hands-off depending on who the chair has been. Um, I will say that for myself, I've been more hands-on. And so outside of meetings on a monthly basis, it could be, you know, five to 10 hours, depending on like how many topics there are that we've been talking about as ZEC. But again, I've been very hands-on in terms of helping with writing things and, you know, then sending sending information on to um, council members and coordinating different things. And I know that that level of support has been really helpful to city staff, especially as they've had different staff transitions and um, just a lot of other things that have been in flux. So um, being hands on can be really helpful for city staff. So basically it's a lot of work, a lot of communications and somebody with good clerical skills. I mean, yeah. it's to it than just saying, okay, the meeting's open and what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. <laughs> there, there, I would say somebody who happens to really enjoy processes and procedures and facilitating conversations is kind of a good fit for this sort of position. And this is what I do for my day job, which is probably why I enjoy it so much. Okay. Hearing no other nominations at this time, we are going to be moving into updates. So Kim, did you want to run through those updates? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, basically, you know, we uh, thank you so much to all of you who have uh, uh, taken the ethics training and also uh, submitted your um, notarized oaths. Um, we do need to have those in. Ideally, we have everything in. Uh, in advance of our next meeting, so um, we're able to take the votes on the vice chair and uh, and, and chair and agenda setting, et cetera. Um, so and, and make decisions on what we might want to do next when it comes to the stormwater presentation that we get. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So there'll be recommendations, and typically that's a that's voted on and passed um, as part of uh, you know sort of official action of the of the organization. Um, so we need to be able to take care of that as well. Um, and uh, I also wanted to mention that we've got um, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board comprehensive plan 
which is open for public comment um, through July 18th. Um, so I did include a link that's there as well. The Upper Harbor Terminal Coordinated Plan um, was basically as of last uh, Friday um, sort of closed, but if folks have other um, uh, uh, comments on it or wanted to have questions about it, feel free to contact me. I can pass them along to staff, but I, I, we wouldn't, as, unless there's more opportunity to comment, um, it is going to city council fairly quickly. There's, and so anyway, it's all a matter of timing and which stuff we can <laughs> work on on that. Um, so that continues to be it. And then actually an interesting thing that's going on um, for the environmental initiative is next week, they're having an environmental initiative uh, uh, session. Uh, yeah. A legislative preview on the environmental folks. So it'll have both the chair of the uh, state uh, Senate um, Committee on the Environment, um, who is Senator Sengem of Rochester, uh, and then also Representative Long of, of Minneapolis, chairs the Energy and Environment Committee in the House, and they'll be in there as well. And then there's one other person, now I'm forgetting off the top of my head, Aaron, that's on the panel. Anyway. I admit that I don't remember who all's on the panel, but part <laughs> of the reason why Kim is bringing this up is because uh, my my day job is with Environmental Initiative, which is an environmental nonprofit that really primarily focuses on how we bring people together to talk about environmental issues and how we can bridge across differences to find solutions that hopefully are able to be more equitable and just for our community. Um, Absolutely. Yes. Every year we have a legislative preview. So if you're interested in hearing what might be environmental priorities at the Capitol this year, I would recommend checking out that event. And one of the big things that the city is pursuing, and we're actually in our third year now of pursuing it, um, is our Better Buildings uh, um, Code which basically um, is going to put in place, hopefully if it gets passed and has been supported by the Department of Labor and Industry and Commerce, as well as the governor's office. Um, in, and we have both Senator Senjum and Representative Long as our chief authors. Um, so we'll see if we can get it done, but it's been tough. Three years now we have support from uh, the National Resources Defense Council. It's part of the Bloomberg American Cities Climate Challenge to help us on that and work with us. We have a great coalition of, of major cities representing 1.2 million people um, in the city, state of Minnesota. So it's been really great, but it just hasn't been able to move in the Senate. Um, so we're really excited about that as a top priority for the city, which would basically require part of the code to move all new building constructions of a certain size to net zero energy by 2036, as far as new building construction. So would be a step, major step in the right direction. So Aaron, what is the time and URL or whatever of the meetings you're talking about? Yeah, so I can make sure to send a link to the legislative preview to Kim. And typically what happens after our meetings are done, usually by Friday-ish, you know, some grace period in there, depending on everything else that's happening in the world. Um, Kim will send out an email with any announcements and updates that came out of the Wednesday meeting. So by Friday, he'll probably be sending out an email and we'll make sure that that link is included in there. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think other than that, what we have at this point is that our uh, next meeting, um, Based on the scheduling poll and based on turnout, we are going to be continuing to keep the meeting on the third Wednesdays of the month from five to seven. If there are particular individuals who have a consistent conflict with that, um, I'll be working on following up with them and also coordinating with Kim to see how we can make sure that they can uh, stay involved. Also, if there are ever any time constraints that end up popping up for you this year, if there are particular you know, again, things that you want to see change during meetings, any of that sort of jazz, uh, feel free to reach out. I, um, it's something where, again, I want to make sure that we're making good use of everyone's volunteer time. 
So I think with that, there's not really much else unless Kim, you have anything. No, I don't. Thank okay. you. So with that, we can adjourn. Um, if it's OK with uh, Kim and Bjorn, I'm OK with staying on for another 10 minutes in case there are any questions that people might have for um, me specifically, especially as one of the longer term SEAC members. So otherwise, I would say go off, enjoy your evening. Uh, if you haven't eaten dinner yet, hope you get something yummy. And Thank you all, and I'll get better over time of learning everybody's voices. Someday I'll be able to get better at learning people's faces. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate yep. it. Thanks, Thanks folks. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Aaron. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you. Yep. Take care, Thank folks. You. Aaron. Yeah. Are you still there? This is Leslie. I got a question. So as far as this, um, the park, yeah, uh, the park uh, plan, are you, are, have you guys put any concerns or your um, input on that plan yet? Good question. I am fairly certain that a couple years ago when the, uh, um, my work building. I'll hear me. Okay. okay. Don't know what's happening with my computer now. Um, can you hear me? Nope. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> okay. Sorry, the internet is like dying for me. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, I'm fairly certain that when they were first starting on putting it together that they came to us for some comments and I think that we submitted some comments, but I will have to dig back and see if I can find that information. But we haven't done any comments on it since uh, it's been more developed. Okay, because I just have my, I, I'm sorry, I'm just so into this soil and storm water management is that it's a great plan, but my thing with the park board, if you go to any of these uh, lakes and all the connections and streams that we have around the whole complete city, they're poorly managed. The people that work there, they drive those, um, I don't know what they're called, these little trucks or transportation on the sidewalks where the people are. There's all kinds of garbage and stuff inside the, um, the ponds and the lakes. And the people that work there just ignore it and keep keep it going. And there's all kinds of soil erosion. They just, I mean, they're not even taking care of what they already have. And for them to put in all this new stuff, um, I, I'm very confused. If they're not taking care of the land that they're already on, how, how are they going to add more stuff to the mess they already have? Mm -hmm. and, and that's my whole thing here. You know, I just, I look at, at the parks and I do the, the the trails and all that. And I just see this whole, whole nother entity of mess. And, and to see this elaborate plan, it's going to be even a bigger mess if they don't clean up the mess they already have. And, and to me, that's just an injustice to the whole city. To me. But I don't know. I, I was just looking and I was just wondering what input you have on it and will we be talking more about it? Yeah, I think since Kim brought it up, it's probably something that we will as a body discuss at some point, particularly, especially before the June 8th, uh, July 18th deadline for comments. Um, but in the meantime, Leslie, I'm going to look up to see if I can find if we have any letters that we wrote to the park board regarding their comprehensive plan. Um, and then I can make sure to send that along to you and then make sure that that's shared with everybody as we start making that more of a topic at some point in the future. And and another thing I was just wondering because of the mass expansion that we have going across the whole city, are we are 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 they planning on hiring any more inspectors because you can just drive down the streets and just see stuff just happening and for four inspectors i don't know how they're hitting all these different sites that is so something i'm just that i yeah that's something i have no idea about 
And so I will follow up with um, Kim on that and see like what sort of intersections we can have as a body with that sort of inspection component. Okay. Well, those are just the only questions I have right now, but um, yeah, I'm that geek. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the questions that I have for, for right now and okay. and um seeing how, how that, that works with this, this pan. Since he, he did mention it and I I seen it before and I said, Okay, well I'll I'll look at it and so I did while we were talking. I didn't know we were gonna break so early but yeah, mm -hmm. so I guess that's the next meeting. Okay. We'll talk and then about. um this is much more of like a me, Aaron, like we're just trying to draw connections. Leslie, I think that some of my coworkers have talked to you recently, like Malia Hausknecht and Mike Carly, potentially, or at least a few months ago. Uh, so just uh, to me to about the about the park? Not about the park. I think that they were probably talking to you about something else. They work really closely with Sam Grant and James Trice, and so I think that they've connected with you through some of the EJCC stuff. All about the soil, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably because I sit on a lot of meetings and I just, you know, since COVID, I'm more at home and so I'm like sitting and just seeing how our city is is changed and how everything is really connected when you get older. Because like me being a kid and I see the pile of dirt, I'm gonna climb up in that pile of dirt and get yelled at when I get home, but <laughs> I'm gonna climb up in that dirt, you know, and so yeah. that was my life, but. Um, now I see what's going on with it and things and how it's really affecting everybody from the north side to the south side and southeast and, and all these little pockets in the health of our community and not really understanding what has impacted us from the mosquito spring when you had to be in the house at five to mm -hmm. everything else. And I just, I, it's just amazing when you get older to see exactly how everything is interconnected and how it affects us as humans when you don't think that when you're younger. Yeah, but it can be very overwhelming as you're trying to draw that web in your head. Yeah, but I don't, the names that you say to me, I do know Trice and, and, and um, Sam Grant because of the committee I'm on, but those other names, I don't know. Not familiar. Okay. I don't know, but I know when they were talking about the Upper Harbor Lights, the, the planning committee who who orchestrated it and told me to look back at their soils, and I said there's no soil management here, only storm water, and you need to implement that in there. And then he came back. He kept coming back at me about the soil, and I thought it was kind of funny. Because if you're going to say the storm water management, then you need to have the soil because you're moving the soil to get the project done. And I just think that, well, I'm sorry I got trained at the U. <laughs> and they ride you like a rodeo there. So, yeah, <laughs> that's my education there and at Augsburg. So I graduated from two schools at this, in the state of Minnesota. So. I just Thanks. wanted to, yeah, so I just, I thank God and thank you for this opportunity to be on this committee. And I don't know these other people, but just listening to the two meetings I did attend, I would keep you in the position that you're in because you're more aware and I would vote for you. I'm just telling you right off the bat. I don't know these other people or their background, but for what you're doing and what I've heard and how it's being conducted and, and ran, I'm very happy with you. I don't, I don't know these other people. I can't say anything about them, but I can't vote for something I, or somebody I don't know nothing about. And I can't do research on them because, you know, Google lies and who knows? <laughs> <I was laughs> you know, I can make that. myself a, an ambassador <laughs> and you'd be like, oh, she's an ambassador. You know, I, so who knows? Yeah, I have an unfair advantage of having facilitated these sorts of meetings in the past. So everybody's gotten to see my skills. But if anybody else were to run, that nobody else has seen their skills in, in how they would see this little body. So are there any other particular questions? No, that's I it. I'm going to let you go. And um, thank you for the time that you gave me to give a clear understanding in my head. And yeah, that's my, my, I, I say what I say and I stand on what I say. And yeah. I just a firm believer that everybody has the right to have clean air, water, and soil. <laughs> that's, my thing but 
Uh, thank you very much and enjoy your yeah. night. Same to you. Bye, Leslie. Uh -huh. Bye. Are there other particular questions? I know that some people have been just sticking around, and so I just was curious if there was any anybody else who had anything. Um, I had a, a policy question for Kim and Bjorn. Um, if curious, uh, I know that sustainable building policy was going to be coming out, and I think um, early January was sort of the timeline. I'm curious if there's been any update on that. Yeah, um, we are. Um, we we had three different components of it. One. One component was the one to three unit housing ones. It's part of Minneapolis homes that when has gone forward, it is part of the current RFP that's open till the end of the month. The enterprise one we are planning to bring forward. It's very for more public comment, um, but uh, it's close to being done. And it's what we brought forward and talked a bit with SEAC, but uh, we will be uh, looking at, you know, having that open at least and it could be a particular topic, but yes, that's going to be there. The economic development one, which um, I want to continue to keep the pressure up, is going to be more probably late quarter two, um, and that that we're working with CPED to get finalized. And there's they have like so, they have many different programs at different sizes, and so there's a little more complication on what that applies to, but. Um, you know, obviously we want to get it out there as, as soon as possible, so it has the most positive impact with the Upper Harbor Terminal, as well as the Kmart site, and some of the other big developments around Southwest, potentially as the LRT gets done. So um, all of those will likely have investment um, by the city. And then of course, with the enterprise, we wanna be able to keep the program going to get to uh, basically constructing net zero energy buildings by 2030. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be the standard uh, and you know, ultra efficient until then and uh, using as much, maxing out as much renewable energy and and also, you know, trying to do the best it possibly can. And, and so we can um, certainly talk more about that or bring that forward, but again, that's another topic <laughs> that uh, takes a little bit of time, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how it's rolling out right now. Awesome, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Yeah. And recognizing that we are oh. now one minute past seven, is there any one additional question Otherwise, we can call it quits. The, this is Nick. I have a follow up on Anna's question. It should be really quick. Okay. Uh, Kim, is there going to be any sort of update cycle baked into what is finally adopted for economic development and enterprise? Just knowing that you know, yes. things like the conversation about net zero and as the electric grid changes and as technologies on gas come around. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it's a required minimum every five years. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, is I'm trying to also set the pathway forward to create the glide path. Um, you know, so it's like, okay, let's shoot for city enterprise to be the leader, net zero energy. And this is one thing that'd be an interesting topic to have with SEAC too, is how do we define it? Net zero energy, yeah. net carbon, you know, I mean, which one do you use? Worldwide, they're starting to move to net zero carbon. Um, so, and how that works out, but it has all the issues with nuclear, et cetera. But def defining for us how we want to move forward with what we're going to define within the climate action and equity plan. And in regards to the also just setting the goal out there, if it's going to be net zero energy by 2036 for all buildings over a certain size, um, let's put the glide path there so you don't have to update it. It's kind of like the built in escalator, or in this case, the built built in de-escalator um, to try to get us there and understand what the pathway is. But it does require also every five years to have the plans updated at a minimum. Thanks. Thank you all. I really uh, appreciate it and got lots of exciting things to, to talk about as we go forward. So appreciate it. We'll look forward to your summary of the meeting. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Thanks, right. Bjorn, for taking Bye. notes, and I hope everyone has a good night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.